Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I'm here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex in their gorgeous rocket garden. I mean, look at this place. How awesome is this to talk to you guys about rocket pollution? Because there's no arguing that rockets aren't incredible pieces of machinery. I mean, forget the fact that they're currently really the only way we have to put anything meaningful into orbit, but seeing and hearing a rocket launch is simply an unforgettable experience. We are in this. We are doing this. Yes. Oh, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. But as awesome as those flames and sounds are, what's not awesome is when you stop and think about just how much a single rocket pollutes. I mean, some might find it ironic that an organization like NASA, who studies our atmosphere, is okay with rockets polluting it so much. Or isn't it weird that Elon Musk, the same person who's pushing for sustainable energy so much with Tesla, also owns a rocket company that runs basically entirely on fossil fuels. And let's not forget about Jeff Bezos, who literally just pledged $10 billion to help combat climate change, is also simultaneously working on a huge rocket that's almost the size of the Saturn V moon rocket that he's going to be launching all the time. I mean, isn't this all just a little bit hypocritical? So today, we're going to do a deep dive into all this. We're going to figure out just how much of what actually comes out of the flamey end of a rocket. Then we'll look at how much different fuels and different engines changes that equation. And then we're going to compare rockets to other forms of transportation and other industries. And we'll even figure out what would happen if SpaceX's proposed Starship point-to-point -point transportation system here on Earth would actually replace jetliners. Would that be an improvement or a massive step backwards as far as emissions go? But that's not the only environmental impact rockets have, is it? I mean, what happens when a rocket crashes into the ocean or into the ground? That can't be good, right? Or what about space debris? I mean, we're hucking so much stuff up into orbit. Shouldn't we be talking about that too? Well, those will be upcoming video topics, but for today, we're just going to be focusing on the environmental impact it has on our air. So by the end of this video, hopefully we'll have a really healthy understanding of the environmental impact that rockets have on our atmosphere. We're gonna figure out whether or not launching rockets is a really reckless thing to be doing, or if in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal. And lastly, we'll look at the things that the aerospace industry is doing today to make rockets better for the future. Let's get started. Three, two, one, and off. one small step to land. This is a question I get asked about all the time. And quite frankly, it's a fantastic question. And there's actually some other articles out there, but they can kind of tend to be misleading and they just barely skim the surface. So they don't really have the context or the hard numbers of all of the stuff to really answer the question right. So I figure it's time we get down to the bottom of this and finally really figure out how big of a deal the emission of rocket launches actually are. So I've spent about five months really trying to gather as much information as I can. I even ended up hiring a researcher, Lisa Sturjanovsky, to help me do some additional research while I continue to just study up on the subject. Because, I mean, as far away as I am from a rocket scientist, I'm even further away from being a climate scientist. But now I've spoken with experts. I've read research paper after research paper and I'm constantly having to update this stupid script because I keep learning things just about every single day because this is a really, really deep, complicated, nuanced, but actually a really interesting topic. So stick around to the end because I promise this is actually quite fascinating. But right off the bat, let me address one thing. I'm no doubt opening up a massive can of internet worms here, but hear me out. We're just gonna go over a bunch of numbers and compare them to some other numbers so that you can form your own opinion on the matter. I know somehow climate change and pollution has kind of become a political topic, I, I guess. It, it honestly doesn't really make any sense to me, but regardless of what you think about words like climate change, greenhouse gases, or CO2, let's all agree we probably don't wanna live on a world that's terribly polluted, and we physically can't live on a world that's uninhabitable. So with that in mind, please, please just keep the comments section clear of politics and pointless internet arguments over climate change and all that kind of stuff. And just look at the raw numbers here with me. And we're gonna use that to shape our knowledge on the impact that rockets have on our planet. And this video is really mostly just going to focus on what actually comes out of the flamey end of a rocket 
And we'll kind of gloss over manufacturing, transport, ground operations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to ignore them and act like it doesn't matter, but because that would kind of turn an already insanely long video into the longest video ever. And a lot of those things are not exclusive to rockets either. This video will be a roller coaster of good and bad. You'll be like, oh, that's not that bad, but oh, that's, that's really bad. Back to, ah, I guess it's actually not that big of a deal over and over. <laughs> but there's so many little side notes and interesting tidbits in this video. So we'll be going to Tangent Town. Sorry, not sorry. But because this video has so many topics and tangents, here's the timestamps for those. There's also some quick links and an article version that has some extra resources, methodology, and the numbers for you to check out in the description as well. So get a drink, a notepad, and your periodic tables ready, because we have lots of science to talk about. So to start off, let's make one thing clear. Humans won't be abandoning traditional rockets anytime too soon. There just simply isn't another form of propulsion feasible with our current technology. As much as I want to believe in anti-gravity warp drive magnetic super thrusters that my comment section seems to be constantly telling me about, until the lizard overlords bless us with access to those things, rockets are really all we've got. After all, rockets are simply machines whose sole purpose is to extract as much kinetic energy out of chemical bonds as possible. And just look at a rocket launch. There's an unbelievable amount of energy involved. Okay, right off the bat, we have something to take into consideration. Notice when a rocket is taking off, there's a giant white cloud of smoke that it leaves behind. That looks pretty nasty, right? And then watch as the rocket ascends. The cloud doesn't actually follow it. The exhaust will end up looking much more clear very quickly. What's going on here? Well, luckily that giant white cloud of smoke isn't actually smoke at all. It's almost entirely a giant cloud of steam. And that's because many rockets and their launch pads utilize a water deluge slash sound suppression system to not only keep the launch pad intact, but it also dampens the sound energy of the rocket so it doesn't actually damage itself. By dumping over a million liters of water during that initial launch sequence, most of that water is vaporized and it turns it into steam. And in doing so, it absorbs a lot of energy with it. So you'll notice that many rockets, when they clear the pad, they no longer have that thick cloud of smoke following them. Although some of them still do, but more on that in a second. So next I'm going to list basically everything that can come out of the flamey end of a rocket. We'll then organize and classify those things. Then we'll show which rocket engines produce what and wrap it all up by showing how much of what each vehicle and each system produce based on their engines and their size and their fuels. Rockets can produce many different emissions, but here's the list of usual suspects. You got CO2, water vapor, carbon soot, carbon monoxide, which will almost always bond and become carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, chlorine, alumina, and sulfuric compounds. Now I should note that I accidentally kept saying nitrous oxides instead of oxides of nitrogen or nitrogen oxides. So just know if you hear me say nitrous oxides, I kind of actually mean the more generic term, which is oxides of nitrogen. So just keep that in mind. There's many other trace gases, but they're literally insignificant. You can barely even measure them compared to these main ones. So we'll really just focus on these primary ones going forward instead of getting into the weeds with all these little tiny trace gases. Out of these main gases, the United States' Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, considers nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, and carbon monoxides as pollutants. Think of most of these things like the bad stuff that comes out of cars or like smog in a big city. Chlorine, alumina, and nitrous oxides can actually destroy ozone and are therefore considered ozone-depleting substances, or ODS and have been very heavily monitored and restricted since 1996. You may have heard that term, punch a hole in the ozone layer or something like that. It's that, but that's just kind of a, the wrong term for it because it's not a layer and you don't really punch holes in it. CO2, nitrogen oxides, soot, and water vapor are greenhouse gases, or they act like one since soot isn't a gas. These are just elements that absorb more heat than the current equilibrium of our atmosphere. This is called radiative forcing, and we'll get more into that a little bit later. But simply put, if there's more of these substances in our atmosphere, our atmosphere will then have the ability to trap more heat from the sun. It's just 
really that simple. Chlorine is actually considered a hazardous air pollutant by the EPA, and sulfuric compounds and nitrogen oxides can actually cause acid rain. And that's really bad for marine life and trees and, well, I guess pretty much anything living. So now, which rocket fuels produce what emissions? Let's compare RP-1, hydrogen, methane, solid rocket fuel, and even hydrazine-based hypergolic fuels. Going over these will pretty much cover the vast, vast majority of rockets and which fuels they actually use. So let's start off with the dirtiest of rocket pollution, and that's solid rocket boosters. You'll typically see solid rocket boosters on the first stage of rockets where high thrust really matters. Perhaps the most famous solid rocket boosters were those two giant white boosters on the side of the space shuttle. They produced over 85% of the space shuttle's thrust at takeoff. But there's also two massive and mighty solid rocket boosters on ESA's Ariane 5. Those huge solid rocket boosters caused the rocket to leap off the pad in a real hurry. You also see SRBs attached to the first stage of many rockets for a little extra oomph. Solid rocket boosters are typically composed of hydrochloric acid, ammonium perchlorates, and the salt of perchloric acid, and ammonia, which are powerful oxidizers. And then there's also aluminum or magnesium powder. These are then held together by a binder, by a bunch of words I know I'm not gonna pronounce anywhere near right. These are usually hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, known as HTPB, or polybutadiene acryl nitrile, <laughs> known as P-band which makes the propellant into a rubbery-like mixture. Please don't make fun of me too much. I'm a terrible pronunciator. This means they emit primarily aluminum oxides, soot or black carbon, CO2, hydrogen chloride, nitrogen oxides, hydrogen, and a few other trace gases. Since we mentioned the space shuttle, let's take a look at its main engines, the RS-25, which ran on hydrogen, or more specifically, hydrogen and liquid oxygen, or otherwise known as Hydrolox. The Delta IV, the Ariane 5 center core engine, and the Centaur upper stage also run on hydrogen. Hydrogen is perhaps the cleanest burning fuel. When you burn hydrogen with oxygen, you literally just get water vapor. But there is a trace amount of nitrous oxides, aka NOx, while the vehicle's in the lower atmosphere, otherwise known as the troposphere, as an afterburning effect of the hot flame coming in contact with our air because literally all rocket engines that are hot, which is pretty much all of them, will do this to a certain degree when in our troposphere, which is primarily composed of nitrogen. Next, let's look at a very common propellant, which has been pretty prevalent throughout the entire history of spaceflight, and this is RP-1, but again, it's mixed with liquid oxygen, so it's known as Carolox. The first stage of the Saturn V used RP-1, as well as the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, the core stage of the Atlas V, the Soyuz, and Rocket Lab's Electron, to name just a small few. RP-1 is basically just a highly refined jet fuel, which in itself is just a highly refined kerosene. When burnt, RP-1 will produce carbon dioxide, water vapor, nitrous oxide, carbon soot, carbon monoxide, which again will mostly become CO2, and a little bit of sulfur compounds. The exhaust is kind of nasty, but it's not really all that different from what a normal internal combustion car engine produces. Speaking of nasty, let's take a look at hypergolic fuels. Hypergolic fuels are those that will spontaneously combust when the fuel and the oxidizer come in contact with each other. This helps make rocket engines extremely reliable as you simplify the ignition sequence. They're also very stable at room temperatures, which means you can actually fuel up a rocket and it will happily sit there ready to launch for long periods of time, which made hypergolic fuels a perfect choice for Titan missiles and other missiles that need to be able to launch quite literally at the push of a button. But hypergolic fuels are also used on the Proton rocket, the abort motors for SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule and Boeing Starliner, and the Space Shuttle's orbital maneuvering system as well. It's also very common in reaction control systems and long duration coast stages for all of these same reasons, being simple, reliable, and stable. But hypergolic fuels include hydrazine, or one of its relatives that I know I'm not gonna pronounce in a anywhere near rightly, like monomethyl hydrazine or unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, which are extremely toxic. Breathe too much of either of those in and you'll likely not live to tell about it. Lung tissue is burned, blisters form, and the resulting moisture accumulation causes asphyxiation. It's mostly the biggest concern if you have unburned hydrazine or a you know, spill some of it while you're trying to handle it. 
So perhaps handling the fuel is a bigger concern than actually burning it. However, when burnt, hypergolics are pretty similar to RP1, producing mostly CO2, water vapor, soot, sulfur-containing compounds, and a bit more nitrogen oxides than other fuels, since nitrogen is a compound found in the oxidizer, which is usually nitrogen tetroxide. Lastly, let's talk about the new kid on the block, methane, or when burnt with liquid oxygen, methalox. Three of the newest rockets coming online in the next couple years will be running on methane. That's SpaceX's Starship, Blue Origin's New Glenn's first stage, and ULA's Vulcan's first stage as well. Methane is probably the next most clean after hydrogen, which makes sense since it's such a similar compound. So when it's burnt, methane just becomes CO2 and water vapor, and again, along with a little bit of nitrous oxides. Now this might be contrary to what you've heard. I mean, it's a common thing to talk about how belching or farts of cows is just methane and how bad of a greenhouse gas that is. Well, that's true but that's because it's unburnt. Methane in the atmosphere is a real powerful greenhouse gas, so it's actually better if it's been burnt and split up into CO2 and H2O, well, at least as far as greenhouse gases go. So let's see some real data on some real world rockets. For this, let's look at a variety of rockets with a variety of different fuels, and we'll actually take a look at how much of what each rocket produces. Let's compare the Titan II rocket, which ran on hypergolic propellants, the Soyuz FG, which runs on RP-1 and has a hypergolic upper stage, the Atlas V N22, which has two solid rocket boosters, an RP-1-fueled main center core, and a hydrogen-powered upper stage, and then the Falcon 9, which runs on RP-1. Then let's compare the Delta IV Heavy, which runs entirely on hydrogen, the Space Shuttle, which ran on hydrogen and two massive solid rocket boosters, the SLS, or the Space Launch System, that is basically a scaled-up Space Shuttle without the orbiter, and runs on two even bigger solid rocket boosters and a massive hydrogen tank and hydrogen upper stage. And lastly, we'll look at Starship and the Super Heavy Booster, which both run entirely on methane. Now, you may have noticed a few things about these choices. First off, I chose these rockets because they're all rockets that have flown or will fly humans. Well, except for the Delta IV Heavy, but you'll see why I wanted to include that one in just a second. But also, you'll notice this selection of rockets covers pretty much all fuel choices. But I should note here, my numbers are pretty accurate, but even direct observational recordings of rocket exhaust gets confusing because of how the exhaust actually ends up interacting with the ambient air. There's a lot of little things like how carbon monoxide will almost immediately become carbon dioxide or how the heat of the exhaust turns atmospheric nitrogen into nitrous oxide. Now, because of all these variables, I've simplified their output by lumping together carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide into just carbon dioxide, which is quite normal. All other carbon sources are lumped into soot and we've just ignored the slight oxygen output that some engines can produce. Now, in general, we combine several sources and our own calculations to actually get a pretty darn accurate total of each vehicle. I'd guess we're probably within about 5 or 10%, and it seems like our numbers tend to line up pretty well with some of the other numbers, which for this purpose is good enough for, you know, comparison and at least relative purposes when comparing, you know, all these rockets together. But do put a little small mental-ish behind all of these numbers just in case. The hypergolic Titan II produced mostly CO2, then some water vapor, nitrous oxide, soot, and sulfur. The Soyuz FG and Atlas V N22 again produces mostly CO2, some water vapor, soot, and nitrous oxides, but because the Atlas V uses those solid rocket boosters, we see a big jump in chlorine and alumina. The Falcon 9 produces just about double what the Soyuz produces, and that makes sense since it burns about twice as much fuel. It should be noted that the Falcon 9 and the Soyuz use RP-1 in the open cycle for its engines. This means there's a gas generator that is very fuel rich, so you'll see much darker smoke coming out of the side of the engine since it has a lot less complete combustion in the gas generator compared to the main engine. It's likely the majority of the exhaust you actually see in the Falcon 9's exhaust trail is from its gas generators. Although all rocket engines do actually run fuel rich in the main combustion chamber, for the right balance of heat management and performance. 
So there's likely going to be unburnt fuel expelled regardless of the cycle type, but just much more when it's an open cycle engine. Now, if you're sitting there confused right now and have no idea what I'm talking about and you need a good rundown on the gas generator and the different types of engine cycles, be sure and watch my Raptor video because I break down all the different cycles and make them, I think, really easy to comprehend. Okay, now back to our chart. The Delta IV Heavy is really cool because it produces zero CO2 and just shoots out over 600 tons of water vapor, but as mentioned, it of course will produce some nitrous oxides in the lower atmosphere and a small amount of carbon from its ablative nozzles, which causes this exhaust to glow orange instead of the clear bluish exhaust that we see from the space shuttle's main engines. The space shuttle and its bigger wingless brother, the SLS, mainly produce CO2, a lot of water vapor, a little soot, nitrous oxide, and a whole lot of chlorine and alumina because of those massive solid rocket boosters. Lastly, Starship will produce by far the most CO2 and water vapor purely because of its massive size, and of course it's going to produce some nitrogen oxides. It should be noted quick that these numbers actually differ from what SpaceX published last year for their Starship Environmental Impact Assessment but they were likely worst case scenarios and for a potentially much larger rocket. And our calculations are based on the nine meter wide 2019 Starship design. But of course, just looking at their output doesn't really tell the whole story, does it? What about their payload capacity? This is a number that's going to vary drastically between vehicles. So for this, let's just look at their tons to low earth orbit capability. So for the Titan II, we get 3.5 tons. The Soyuz FG with 7, the Atlas V at 13, the Falcon 9 at 15.5 while being reused, like it pretty much always does now. But it should be noted, its expendable payload is a bit more at 22.8. The Delta IV Heavy at 29 tons, the Space Shuttle at 28 tons, the SLS quoted here is Block 1 with 95 tons to LEO, and lastly, Starship will currently be the king of this group at 100 tons. And now that we have all these numbers up on screen, here's where the fun begins. We can really do some fun ratios here to truly see how much work each rocket performs compared to their emissions. So let's start off with their CO2 to low Earth orbit payload ratio. So that means the lower the number here, that's the less CO2 they're producing to actually be able to really perform work. The Titan II was 10 tons of CO2, per ton of payload to low Earth orbit, the Soyuz at 35, the Atlas V at 20, the Falcon 9 at 27 when reused or 19 when expendable, the Delta IV Heavy at zero, the Space Shuttle at 16, SLS at six, and Starship at 27. Next up, let's see their water vapor to low Earth orbit payload ratio. So again, the lower the number here, the less water vapor they're putting in the atmosphere to do the same amount of work. The Titan II produced four tons of H2O per ton of payload to LEO. The Soyuz FG and the Atlas V and 22 are nine tons. The Falcon 9 is 10 tons when reused or seven when expendable. The Delta IV Heavy produces 22 tons. The Space Shuttle, 35 tons. The SLS will produce 14 tons and Starship, 22 tons. Now, lastly, let's compare their ozone depleting compounds. And again, this was nitrogen oxides, alumina, and chlorine to their payload capability. So again, the lower the number here, the less ozone is going to deplete to put stuff in space. All the rockets without solid rocket boosters produce nearly zero tons per ton to orbit, while the Atlas V N22 produces four tons, the Space Shuttle 21.7, and the SLS at 7.7. .7. Now you might notice that the SLS here performs much better than the space shuttle in terms of emissions to payload capacity because the SLS has a much greater payload capacity than the space shuttle. Now this is mostly because the space shuttle had to lug that massive orbiter into orbit, which wasn't actually considered part of its payload capacity. And we're also only comparing the block one version of SLS, which only has a small, much less capable upper stage. So things are actually pretty interesting here, aren't they? Rockets don't really seem like a very eco-friendly way to transport stuff, do they? There's an awful lot of things coming out of the back per kilogram for every rocket really, but a purely hydrogen powered rocket. But there's a lot of notes here. Here we go. We're going to Tangent Town. <laughs> of course, putting something into orbit requires an unbelievable amount of energy. 
So as we go forward, keep that in mind. We're not talking about long haul trucking here. We're talking about accelerating huge payloads 10 times faster than a bullet. Now you also may have noticed me quoting what happens when you expend a Falcon 9 instead of reusing it, and you might be tempted to think, oh wow, it emits quite a bit more per ton of payload when you try and reuse it. Well, this is a topic we're not really going to talk about too much here because it's a huge, huge rabbit hole. But the manufacturing of a rocket is much worse for the environment than the launch itself. But this is where I didn't want to get too much into the weeds here because manufacturing of aluminum and steel is a whole different topic and is in no way exclusive to rockets. If we want to debate the impact manufacturing has on our planet, that's a whole different subject that I don't think we really need to get to in this video. We're just focusing on the actual flight of the rocket and what comes out of that flamey end. That being said, in the case of the Falcon 9, you're much better off reusing a rocket so you can amortize that pollution and carbon output of the manufacturing process over several flights and not just a single flight. I said I wouldn't get into a rabbit hole and here I am in like the biggest rabbit hole ever because we'd actually need to figure out how much the fleet of recovery vessels emit too before we really knew the total lifespan emissions of an expendable rocket versus a reusable one. But one fun little note here is that rockets could potentially be a solution to manufacturing pollution and CO2 emissions. In fact, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon and Blue Origin, paints a very interesting picture of what he thinks the future should look like. In May 2019, during a speech about Blue Origin's proposed Blue Moon Lander, Bezos shared his vision of using rockets to actually move energy production and heavy industry off Earth, which would then keep Earth as more of a sanctuary in the future. Now, I think this is actually a really, really cool concept, and it has almost nothing to do with this video. <laughs> Sorry, I keep doing this. But you should definitely watch that speech because it has some really compelling ideas. But here's another cool note. A rocket running on hydrogen or methane can actually become mostly carbon neutral if the production of the fuels is powered by renewable energy. Unfortunately, most hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels by steam reforming natural gas, methane, or coal gasification. When hydrogen is produced in this manner, it's not a very sustainable source of fuel. But hydrogen can be manufactured using electrolysis to extract it from water, although it's relatively inefficient. And you can actually create methane by just pulling carbon dioxide from the air and adding it to hydrogen using the Sabatier process. This means you can actually extract the CO2 from the air that's emitted from the rocket, or I guess anything really, and turn it right back into rocket fuel for your next flight. Now, I know this sounds a bit obtuse, like, come on, <laughs> that can't be right. I mean, isn't it going to take a lot of energy to do that and that'll just create more emissions? Again, not if you run your fuel production off of renewable energy. This is something that SpaceX will likely roll out as a cost-effective way to not only fuel up their Starship, but it's also good practice for a vital refueling process necessary to get home from Mars. That's right. In order to get back from Mars, SpaceX will need to have this exact process down. So it'll probably make an awful lot of sense for them to utilize the Sabatier process basically right away so they can become experts at it by the time humans will rely on it to actually get home. But it should be noted, if you're relying on solar to refuel a starship on Mars, it will require a lot of solar panels. And boy, do I mean a lot. Mars Society founder and full-blown Martian exploration evangelist, Robert Zubrin, told Elon Musk he's concerned about how much solar it'd actually take to refuel a single starship claiming it'd need to be a solar field the size of six to 10 football fields. To that, Elon said, so be it. Now, before we try and compare rockets to really anything else like jetliners, we should probably talk about how rocket emissions have different effects at different altitudes. Now, because rockets burn their propellant in all the layers of the atmosphere, including the upper atmosphere known as the stratosphere, 
and well, even beyond that, their effects can last a lot longer since they don't actually end up getting cycled as quickly as down at sea level. And seeing as CO2, soot, and water vapor are greenhouse gases, the longer they're in the air, the more time they have to warm up our planet due to a process known as radiative forcing. Water vapor in the lower atmosphere cycles really quickly into clouds and rain, and nature pretty much automatically regulates it no problem. Although CO2 won't cycle as quickly or as easily as water vapor, it can eventually cycle out in the troposphere by becoming delicious tree food. <laughs> but when you put any of these things really high up in the atmosphere, they tend to stick around a lot longer. Water vapor is actually a much more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. You can kind of think of CO2 as the thermostat and the water vapor as the heater kind of. But regardless, CO2 emissions in the stratosphere from rockets isn't really that different than CO2 emissions in the troposphere or lower atmosphere. But carbon soot and alumina is what we should really be most concerned about putting in the stratosphere instead of water vapor or CO2. So rockets that have, say, SRBs or RP-1 will produce a fair amount of soot and or alumina. And one study actually showed that they can generate about 30 times more atmospheric heating or radiative forcing than a Hydrolox rocket. And it's actually a little more confusing here because when it comes to emissions in the stratosphere versus say the troposphere, there's actually certain spots where there's huge impacts. Researchers found that when jetliners fly in conditions that'll make those condensation trails, which is the right mix of altitude, humidity, and temperature, you know, those frozen ice cloud-like streaks in the sky, that'll actually end up trapping a surprising amount of heat in our atmosphere. One study published in February 2020 by a group of researchers from Imperial College London found minor changes in jetliners' altitude can have drastic changes on their emissions effects. But researchers all tend to agree that they really need to study this more to really accurately calculate and model the impact that stratospheric emissions have because honestly, it's all very confusing. So this is all starting to get pretty interesting. I think it's time we actually compare rockets to airliners and really get a sense for how bad rockets are, especially when they're used for transporting people. And I know, we've thrown around a lot of numbers already. A lot. And there really hasn't been that much context for these numbers, but you know, I just really wanted to get it all out there so you know exactly what gets put into the air when a rocket launches. So let's do a little comparison of six different vehicles. Six very different vehicles. We're going to compare the three vehicles that can currently ferry astronauts to the International Space Station, which is the Falcon 9, the Atlas V N22, and the Soyuz. Then we'll add Starship as well, along with two really common airliners, the Boeing 747-8 and the Boeing 737-800. The reason I chose these vehicles is because, again, they all carry passengers, and even more fun, the Falcon 9, Soyuz, and the booster of the Atlas V, and the two jets, actually run on virtually the exact same fuel. The jets run on Jet A jet fuel, which again is just a highly refined kerosene, while the rockets run on RP-1, which is an even higher refined kerosene. The reason I put Starship in this mix is mostly because A, it's Freaking huge! <laughs> and for now, it represents a rocket with by far the worst case scenario for total emissions. And B, SpaceX actually wants to use it as a point-to-point -point transportation on Earth. So we'll actually quote the Starship in two configurations. Starship and Super Heavy for the orbital spaceflight missions, and also just Starship for those Earth-to-Earth -Earth rapid transportation that might actually directly compete with the airline industry someday. One more note here, we first calculated the worst case scenario for an airliner as if they flew full of all of their fuel and had depleted all of their fuel each and every flight, but it'd be a really bad flight if your jet ran out of fuel and airliners only fill a little more than what's actually necessary for their route. So that being said, we took their maximum potential output as if their tanks were filled to the brim and then we divided that in half, since that's a much better representation of the overall average amount of fuel used by these jetliners on, say, a medium or long haul route. Which, I should mention, really, if we're comparing it to, say, Starship, 
we really should only be comparing the long haul routes, but I figured this was a pretty decent estimate. Now, because we can pretty fairly compare CO2 between rockets and jetliners, let's just focus on the CO2 outputs of all these vehicles. But we'll want to keep in mind that the rockets that emit carbon soot or alumina into the stratosphere, like the Falcon 9, the Atlas V, and the Soyuz, that's definitely not a good thing. So just like we showed before, the Falcon 9 releases 425 tons of CO2 per flight, the Atlas V 259 tons, the Soyuz 243 tons, and Starship releases 2,683 tons for the full stack, and the Starship alone only releases 716 tons. Now compare that to a 747 at 302 tons of CO2 and 60 tons for the 737. But now remember, these numbers have the jets only using half of their fuel per flight. So these numbers could vary a lot. Actually, some of the time it'll probably be a lot lower than that. But I figured this was still a decent estimate of the average CO2 emissions of each different route. And also that can vary too, depending on how many people are on each flight. But yeah, that's not exclusive to airlines either. So now how about passengers? The Falcon 9 can carry up to four passengers in a crew Dragon capsule. The Starliner on top of an Atlas V can carry four passengers as well. And the Soyuz and Soyuz capsule can carry three passengers. Starship can carry up to 100 passengers to low Earth orbit. And then after they refuel it, they could actually take those same 100 people off to the moon or on really long trips off to Mars. For Starship point to point, we don't have an exact number, but considering there's almost a thousand cubic meters of pressurized payload capacity, let's just say 400 passengers could pretty easily be comfortable for a 45 minute flight. Now compare that to a 747, which can hold up to 416 passengers and only 756 cubic meters of volume, you'll realize 400 in a Starship for a short duration was being quite conservative. And lastly, the 737 can carry up to 180 passengers. So now how about their CO2 per passenger? Well, here's where some of these rockets really aren't an ideal form of transportation. With the Falcon 9 at 106.25 tons of CO2 per passenger, the Atlas V at 64.75 per passenger, and the Soyuz at 81 tons of CO2 per passenger per flight. <laughs> but don't forget, low Earth orbit and Dallas are very different destinations. Now compare that to 26.83 tons of an orbital Starship with 100 people on board, and you realize that we can actually make some pretty drastic improvements to those per passenger numbers. And then just look at Starship doing suborbital trips with 400 people. It would come down to only 1.79 tons per passenger that's actually not that bad. Now compare that to a 747 at 0.73 tons per passenger, and the 737 is king here at only 0.33 tons per passenger. So Starship actually gets pretty close to a 747, at least as far as per passenger CO2 emissions go. On certain long haul routes with certain passenger loads, it might be very comparable. Sure, in general, it could be over twice as bad on certain routes and things, but at least it's not two orders of magnitude worse like some of the other rockets. But don't forget, now with carbon capture, we could actually almost null out an entire Starship flight entirely. And that's something you just can't do with RP-1 or Jet-A jet fuel. Although synthetic jet fuels are being worked on. But with continued improvements, could we ever get rockets to be as efficient as jetliners? Now you might be tempted to think that because rockets only burn fuel for a few minutes and then they coast in the frictionless vacuum of space, couldn't it actually be a really efficient form of transportation? Well, the problem lies in two main issues. One, a rocket has to counteract gravity in order to fly. So just to get off the ground, it has to create at least its own weight and thrust before it even begins to move. This is called gravity drag. So imagine if a rocket has a thrust to weight ratio of 1.2. The relative acceleration is only 0.2 Gs because gravity is pulling it back down with one G. If you gave that same rocket a thrust to weight ratio of 2.0, you'd essentially accomplish five times the amount of work because the relative acceleration is a full G on top of the one G pulling against the rocket. This is something that planes don't really need to contend with. Their aerodynamic lift is what counters and overcomes gravity. 
Although this lift can actually induce drag, the engines themselves don't really need to waste any of their energy directly counteracting gravity. So planes can fly with a thrust to weight ratio below one, although some fighter jets can and do have thrust to weight ratios beyond one, and that rules. The other issue between rocket engines and jet engines is engine efficiency. Chemical rocket engines, although some are getting pretty efficient, can't really get much above about 450 seconds of specific impulse in a vacuum, which is their measure of how much work you can do with X amount of fuel. This is where jet engines have a huge advantage as their specific impulse is usually measured in the thousands. And they kind of get to cheat by using oxygen from the atmosphere and also using the air as reaction mass. So a jet engine can just simply do much, much more work with the same amount of fuel. So despite a jet engine needing to run for hours and hours to really be able to cover the same distance that a rocket can do in just seven minutes of burning a rocket engine, a jet engine actually sips on much, much less fuel during the entire phase because of its wings providing lift and the jet engines being so stinking efficient. Whereas a rocket will need to consume much more fuel in a very short period of time to do the same amount of work. I mean, just look at a rocket in a plane. A rocket is basically all fuel and a little payload, and a plane is basically the exact opposite. That pretty much tells the whole story right there. Which is definitely why the Skylon hybrid rocket plane concept would be pretty appealing. It's mixing the best of both worlds. While in the atmosphere, its Sabre engine uses the oxygen from the air to perform an efficient air breathing cycle. It uses wings while it's in the atmosphere too. Once the atmosphere gets too thin for its engine in that cycle to work or the wings, the engines switch over to a closed loop system where it performs more like a traditional rocket engine. This would be a really cool concept that could potentially help bridge the gap between rockets and jetliners. I still need to do an updated version of my video about single stage to orbit vehicles and debate whether or not we'll really ever see them fly. So stand by as I think that's definitely a video I need to redo. So I think it's time we actually look at just how many launches there are per year and compare them to the number of flights per year in the commercial airline industry. In 2018, there were 114 orbital launch attempts, which was actually the most orbital launches in almost 30 years. The majority of launches came from China that year, with the United States close behind and SpaceX alone making up the vast majority of the US launches. Now in that same year, there were 37,800,000 commercial departures of aircraft. So that's 331,579 times more flights than there were rocket launches. CO2 emissions from all commercial aviation in 2018 totaled 918 million tons of CO2. Now compare that to the 22,780 tons from the aerospace industry in that same year, and you realize that we need to fly 40,300 times more rockets per year to equal the output of airliners. That's 4,594,200 rocket launches a year, or 12,586 launches per day. And that's assuming the same ratio of dirty solid rocket boosters, hypergolic, or Carolox rockets that we had in 2018, rather than this new trend we're seeing towards cleaner Methalox or Hydrolox alternatives. Although in 2018, with China launching the most, using lots of solids and hypergolic rockets, and increasing their launch rates drastically still, it might be a bit before cleaner rockets actually outweigh the dirtier ones. Okay, so now we know what it'd be like to continue launching fairly small rockets like those from 2018 with their modest CO2 outputs. Now, how many Starship launches per day would there need to be to equal airliners? The answer, 937 full stack Starship slash super heavy launches or 3,512 Starship only point to point launches per day. But hold on, let's pause and remember that we still actually need to study the effects that water vapor and CO2 have in our stratosphere more in order to actually understand them better. But even if we find out they're a whole order of magnitude worse than we previously thought, we'd still be launching an 
awful lot of mega rockets per day before it even begins to compare to the airline industry. Now, believe it or not, the nitrogen oxides that are formed during reentry can actually have a pretty bad effect on stratospheric ozone. In fact, coming back in for reentry can actually be just as bad for ozone as the actual ascent. So if a vehicle like Starship were to be flying 5,000 times a year, it produced as much damage to the ozone as all meteorites during that same time frame. So if we did start to see Starship flying as often as an airliner, ozone depletion due to reentry and nitrogen oxide emissions on ascent would certainly become a really big concern that airliners don't really need to contend with. Now, I think it's time we put airliners into perspective, since we've been using them as the benchmark for CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions from the airline industry were only 2.4% of global CO2 emissions. So that means in 2018, the global CO2 output of rockets was only 0.0000059% of all CO2 emissions. In other words, there's a lot bigger fish to fry. Worrying about the current CO2 output of rockets compared to the rest of the world's contributions would be like worrying about focusing on a single leaf in a forest fire. There's much worse offenders that we should actually be focusing on. Maybe here's something we should actually be focusing on before we worry about rockets. Two-stroke internal combustion engines, you know, those small, cheap engines that power leaf blowers, chainsaws, lawnmowers, and some jet skis, they only burn about 70% of the gas that you put into them cleanly. The rest actually becomes pollutants like carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, and hydrocarbons. Tests found that an Echo two-stroke leaf blower is actually a horrible polluter generating 23 times the carbon monoxide and nearly 300 times more non-methane hydrocarbons or NMHCs than a Ford F-150 SVT Raptor. So to put that into perspective, the hydrocarbon emissions from about a half hour yard work with a two stroke leaf blower are about the same as driving 2000 kilometers from Florida to Portland, Maine in a 2011 Ford F-150 SVT Raptor. And as far as the transportation industry goes, regular old cars and light duty vehicles on the road make up over 50% of the transportation industry's global CO2 emissions. So let's just pretend that Starship does actually end up launching and producing as much as the entire airline industry currently does and it doesn't you know, reduce demand on the airlines. All we'd have to do is just reduce total car emissions by only 15% globally. Now forget semis, buses, trains, planes, shipping, don't, don't touch any of those, just passenger cars. It would actually offset the entire Starship point-to-point -point fleet launching over 3,500 times a day. And I'm gonna go ahead and personally guess that by the time Starship point-to-point -point is actually flying consistently in a decade or two, cars will have made a much bigger improvement by then in their total emissions. And you know, if Elon Musk actually gets his way, the world will be transitioning to more sustainable cars sooner rather than later. And we're still not even close to talking about the biggest polluters. Again, if we're worried about pollution or CO2 emissions, there's a lot bigger fish to fry. I mean, rockets don't even begin to shift the scales or make a blip on the radar of global emissions. So rockets are just a tiny little drop in the grand scheme bucket of emissions currently. But that doesn't mean we should just give them a pass, right? I mean, shouldn't every industry be working on improvements? So what steps can the aerospace industry do to actually make tangible improvements? As far as each rocket goes, the most obvious thing to do is stop using solid rocket boosters. SRBs are very bad for our environment. They emit nasty, toxic compounds and they deplete ozone. Then we should probably move away from hypergolic and fossil fuel based fuels like RP-1. That would be another good step. Utilizing either methane or hydrogen could be more sustainable, either by producing hydrogen from electrolysis or by continuing that process and extracting CO2 from the atmosphere and making methane. 
But if we go a step further, the industry should actually be utilizing closed cycle engines like the RD180, the RS25, the RD181, the full flow stage combustion cycle Raptor engine, and the BE4, which will have more complete combustion and not pollute as much as an open cycle engine with a gas generator, especially when you're burning RP1. Closed cycle engines also tend to have a higher specific impulse, which means they can actually do more work with the same amount of fuel because it's kind of like a rocket's fuel economy. Improving that is a total win-win. But perhaps the biggest thing by far would be to stop throwing rockets away. Again, as I mentioned briefly, the manufacturing of a rocket produces a lot of CO2 and pollution itself. We didn't even really get into the half of it. As a matter of fact, manufacturing of steel is a huge global producer of CO2 which produces about 8% of global CO2 emissions. But using steel might be a better choice than actually using carbon composites or carbon fiber because you'll produce a huge amount of CO2 in the production of that or in the autoclave when you cure it. Now again, because the manufacturing process produces all of these emissions, when a rocket gets thrown away every single launch, we should be tacking on those emissions to the launch for the total output of the rocket. If a rocket gets reused over and over, you can spread out those manufacturing emissions over the lifetime of the rocket, which would greatly reduce the total emissions from the rocket more than any fuel change or engine choice ever really could. But as far as improving rockets, we should change fuels, change engines, and reuse them. It's honestly really that simple. And of course, these are all trends in the aerospace industry anyway, so really, it's a win-win. Or perhaps we should all just plant a few billion trees. Hashtag team trees. <laughs> Sorry I am so late on this, but for real, now is probably just as good of a time as any to bring up the rear and plant a few more trees at teamtrees.org. Because whether or not rockets are really that big of a deal for our air, no one can argue that trees aren't a really good thing. So to summarize, how bad are rockets for our air and our climate? Well, compared to other forms of transportation, each rocket that launches isn't great per se. I mean, you probably wouldn't want to start shipping, you know, simple packages via rockets. But then again, the cost will probably always keep that off the table anyway. But compared to even a small player in total CO2 emissions like the airline industry, rockets currently don't even compare at all. <laughs> We'd need several orders of magnitude more launches to even begin to need to factor in their contributions compared to other industries. So obviously, rockets aren't ideal. But for now, they're all we've got. And it's gonna be a really, really long time before we need to worry about the environmental impact that they have on our air, at least compared to, quite frankly, just about everything else. And not to mention that possibility of potentially moving heavy industry off of our planet using rockets, perhaps their mild emissions could end up being our planet's biggest savior. And besides, if it weren't for rockets, we wouldn't have the observation and data collecting satellites that we can use to actually monitor our planet, well, and other worlds to further shape our knowledge about our place amongst the universe and our effects on our own little planet. So what do you guys think? Do you think rockets are a terrible thing and we absolutely need to stop launching them immediately? Do you think there's something we kind of just need to pay attention to and tweak and hope that we can make improvements on? Or do you think they're just really not that big of a deal compared to everything else? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I have some very special thanks to give for this video because this was a really hard one. And if it wasn't for people like Lisa Stojanovsky who helped me uh, actually research a lot of these topics or Mary Liz Bender and Ryan Chelinsky from Cosmic Perspective for helping me shoot some of those scenes and some of these beautiful rocket launches, I wouldn't have had such an awesome video. Or especially big thanks to Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex for allowing me to actually go out there and shoot in the rocket garden. I mean, what a dream come true. <laughs> How awesome was that? But of course, I still owe a huge, huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. Guys, <laughs> this one just about ruined me and you were so patient and helping me figure out all these strange little nuanced details of this topic and you really gave me some excellent feedback. So I owe the biggest thank you to you for not only being patient, 
for also helping me script and research. If this is something you want to help do, if you were sitting here wishing that you could contribute or maybe add your opinion on the script before it comes out, consider becoming a Patreon member, where you'll gain access to our exclusive subreddit, our exclusive Discord channel, and monthly live streams as well by going to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Or if you want another fun way to support what I do, consider going to everydayastronaut.com slash shop, where you'll find awesome shirts like the Full Flow Stage Combustion Cycle t-shirt. That's, I guess, one of Elon Musk's favorite t-shirts. And you can find other things like the Aerospike t-shirt or the pointy end up, flamey end down shirt. And don't forget, there's also our rapid unscheduled discount section where you can get really good deals on some leftover inventory. And if you work in the aerospace industry, click on the link in the apparel section and you'll be able to take 25% off any apparel as my thank you to you for helping us get off this planet. So keep up the good work. We're all counting on you. That's everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.